80% watch me without a subscription, and by clicking just one subscribe button, you will be recommended more interesting videos from my channel. Also, do not forget to like after viewing and write your opinion on this case in the comments Viktor Senko, Igor Suprunyuk and Alexander Ganja studied in the same class and were friends since childhood. Viktor's father Igor Senko worked in the prosecutor's office. Suprunyuk's mother is a high, ranking official, and his father Vladimir Suprunyuk is a former pilot of Leonid Kukma. There is information that Seenko's school nickname was, Boy Girl, due to the fact that he was very much attached to Suprunyuk and was led to any whims of a friend. The first time the guys had problems with the law was in the fifth grade, when they threw stones at the windows of houses. However, thanks to the connections of their parents, they avoided responsibility. During the investigation after the arrest of the guys, it turned out that Senko and Suprunyuk committed their first crimes in 2003 to 2004, when they were 15 years old. These were thefts, robberies, tortures and massacres of homeless animals, armed robberies using cold weapons. The criminals attacked the victims with fittings and metal pipes, but later Suprunyuk decided that they were not effective, since the victims sometimes resisted. Then they started using hammers and sledgehammers. According to investigators, Alexander Ganja participated in two robberies. In the eighth grade, Suprunyuk attacked a boy who was much younger, and Senko took his bike. A couple of years before the massacres, maniacs with a group of peers brutally dealt with two teenagers, actually disfiguring their faces for life. Seenko and Suprunyuk dealt with homeless animals, filmed all the actions on video, photographed against the background of bodies. This went on for a year and a half before a series of attacks on people. Many neighbors saw Suprunyuk pushing stray dogs and cats on his car, donated by his parents. Despite the fact that everyone saw it, no one complained to the police. Over time, the monsters switched from animals to bullying people. More than 70 people were injured at the hands of criminals. According to the memoirs of friends, Seenko and Suprunyuk often talked about their intentions to take the lives of 40 people in order to become killers. According to investigators, Seenko and Suprunyuk moved from the massacre of animals to human lives because of a sense of impunity. They set up a place for themselves in one of the abandoned buildings. The computer subsequently stored videos and photographs of the crimes committed, a complete list of victims whom Suprunyuk called his slaves and believed that, in the afterlife they would serve him. Subsequently, the files from the computer became the main evidence against the criminals. In the spring of 2007, the police conducted an inspection in an abandoned building where, according to their information, there was a brothel. It was one of the shelters of the Dnipropetrovsk maniacs. Their operatives found boxes with animal limbs. The murderers preferred to attack people weaker than women, children, pensioners, the disabled or drunk. All the reprisals of criminals took place according to one scenario, the attack was carried out unexpectedly, for no reason, during which the victim was hit on the head with a hammer or other heavy and sharp object, more often with a rebar. One of the victims was a pregnant woman whose fetus was cut out of her womb. The abuse of the victims was not reported. On July 14 to 16, 2007, the police found two bodies a day. Among the victims were homeless, some could not be identified. The criminals went hunting in Suprunyuk's car and on a stolen scooter and attacked various people who got in their way. Taking money or property was not the main motive, they even left jewelry with some victims. However, they handed over mobile phones for sale. They filmed the process of the attack and the torment of their victims on a mobile phone video camera. The first massacre was committed on June 25, 2007, the victims were Katerina Ilchenko and 34-year-old Roman Tatarevich. On July 1, 2007, 15-year-old Yevgeny Grishchenko and a certain Nikolai Serchuk were deprived of their lives in Novomoskovsk. The next two attacks occurred on the night of July 7, 2007. First, the criminals dealt with the 28-year-old janitor Elena Shram, and two hours later, Yeager Nechvoloda, 
who was demobilized from the army. On the same day, monsters attacked two 13-year-olds. One of them, Vadim Lyakov from the city of Podgorodnoy, managed to escape, and his friend Alexander was less lucky. The next victim was a disabled man, 48-year-old Sergei Yatsenko, who was riding a bicycle. The video shot by Senko shows how Suprunyev wrapped a hammer in a bag and knocked Yatsenko off his bike with it, then continued to deliver multiple blows. The video of how they bullied him was posted on the internet from a computer club. Later this video became very famous on the internet. His body was found only four days later. A few days later, on July 14, 45-year-old Natalia Mamerchuk was riding her moped to the neighboring village of Dievka. When crossing the forest area, two men ran out and threw her off the moped. Then they took her life. Local witnesses tried to catch up with them, but to no avail. In just a month from June to July 2007, Sayanko and Suprunyak took the lives of 21 people. Subsequently, they explained the motive of their crimes by the desire to harden the will and become killers and so that, there would be something to remember in old age. With the increase in the number of victims in Dnipropetrovsk, rumors about serial maniacs began to spread, but the police did not connect all the cases into one for a long time, because the victims were too different. The connection between the crimes was not established until the attack on July 7 on two young men in Podhorodnoy. There were witnesses to the crimes. One of the two guys from whom the criminals took away their bicycles miraculously managed to escape, Vadim Lyakov from the city of Podgorodnoy, who escaped, despite the blow to the head inflicted by the killers. Vadim Lyakov, the surviving victim, was initially under arrest on suspicion of taking his friend's life. According to him, he was denied access to a lawyer, and the police used force against him during the interrogation. However, it quickly became clear that he was not responsible for the death of his friend, given that a series of massacres of people continued. Lyakov cooperated with the investigation in creating sketches of the attackers. Two local guys who also witnessed the attack on Natalia Mamerchuk on July 14 also provided a detailed description that coincided with Lyakov's description. An operational group headed by a senior investigator left Kiev urgently. Most law enforcement agencies were involved in the search, and more than 2,000 employees worked on the case. The investigation was initially kept secret. No official information about the perpetrators or warnings were made public. However, thanks to rumors of attacks, local residents were afraid to leave their homes. Over time, the investigation decided to release a limited number of sketches of criminals and lists of stolen items from local pawn shops, thanks to which the stolen items were soon found in one of the pawn shops of the Novokodaksky district. Shortly before the arrest, Suprunyak and Senko knocked a man off his scooter with a hammer in broad daylight in front of numerous witnesses and stole it. There was a witness who saw the attempt of maniacs to drown stolen scooters in the lake and called the police. He also gave a full description of the perpetrators. However, they were directly contacted when they tried to sell a mobile phone to one of the victims. On July 23, when activating the phone in a pawn shop, the signal was intercepted by the police. Sienko and Suprunyak left the pawn shop. The policemen bought a phone, which they handed over. All contacts were erased on it, but there were videos of the massacre of Sergei Yatsenko and photos of dead cats and dogs. Sienko and Suprunyak were identified from the video and detained on July 24, 2007. The criminals also pointed to the third gang member Ganju, who in turn made an attempt to get rid of the stolen phones by flushing them down the toilet, however, the investigators then managed to find them. After graduating from school, Ganja worked temporary jobs, including a cook and a construction worker. At the time of his arrest, he was unemployed. Senko entered the Metallurgical Institute by correspondence and worked as a security guard. Suprunyak was officially unemployed, but in fact he worked as a taxi driver in a car donated by his parents. A few months before the massacre, Suprunyak, with the help of Sienko and Ganji, began robbing taxi passengers. A green diwu with a taxi driver checker was often described as the transport used during the attack. During the interrogation, it turned out that some of the victims were originally taxi passengers. 
Three suspects were charged with 29 attacks, 21 of which ended in deprivation of life, and eight victims managed to survive. Suprunya was charged with 27 cases, including 21 taken lives, eight armed robberies, and one case of animal husbandry. Senko was accused of 25 cases, including 18 reprisals, five robberies, and one knifing. Ganja was charged with two counts of armed robbery. The evidence was traces of blood on the suspect's belongings and videos of their attacks. The suspect's father, Igor Senko, insisted that the criminals in the video are not suspects and the video itself is a montage. The prosecution asked for life imprisonment for Suprunya and Seenko and 15 years for Ganges and asked for the lifting of the moratorium on the death penalty. Immediately after the arrest, a forensic psychiatric examination was carried out, which recognized all three defendants as sane and aware of the commission of all crimes. Suprunya behaved calmly, considering that his father has an expensive lawyer. But Seenko was visibly nervous. At first, all the detainees confessed to the crimes, but after the final charge was brought, Suprunyuk refused to confess and began to claim that the confession was forced out of him by force. During the investigation, many interrogations were carried out. A comrade of the three criminals Kozlov, arrested in another case, in exchange for good conditions of detention, testified against them and became the main witness for the prosecution. In the building, which was a gathering place for maniacs, a hammer with numerous traces of blood and video files from a computer were seized. The investigation had enough materials and video footage of the criminals themselves to achieve a guilty verdict. The trial began in June 2008. About 50 victims were involved in the case. She went to see the girl off and didn't come back. And the fact that Suprunya and Seenko are to blame for her death, I am 100% sure. I want them to sit for life, so that they ask God for death. That's all, said Lydia Ilchenko, the mother of the deceased Ekaterina Ilchenko, in the last word, Alexander Ganja said, if I knew what atrocities these people are capable of, I would not have approached them for a cannon shot. On February 11, 2009, Suprunya and Senko were sentenced to life imprisonment, Alexander Ganja, the only one who fully admitted his guilt and repented, was sentenced to nine years of imprisonment in a high, security colony. Seenko and Suprunyuk, despite the guilty verdict, continued to deny their guilt, and their parents appealed the court's decision first to the Dnipropetrov's Court of Appeal, which on August 15, 2009 upheld the verdict. Later, the verdict was appealed to the Supreme Court of Ukraine, which on November 24, 2009 upheld the decisions of the lower courts on the life imprisonment of Suprunyuk and Seenko. The third defendant Ganja did not dispute his sentence, nine years in prison. After his release, Ganja got married, and children were born in the marriage. He refuses to talk to journalists and show his face. The neighbors know what he was in prison for, but in their opinion, Ganja has improved. According to unofficial information, Igor Suprunyuk is serving his sentence in the Dnipropetrovsk pre-trial detention center in a block for life convicts, where, according to rumors, harsh conditions of detention. Viktor Senko was placed in prison in Krivoy Rog, where he corresponded with a girl. She stopped communicating with him when she found out what he was sitting for. According to Senko's father, they communicated with the second one for a couple of months, but did not get along with the characters. The parents of Igor Suprunyuk and Viktor Seenko planned to challenge the verdict to the European Court of Human Rights, claiming that the case was fabricated. 